next speaker um, has spent a lifetime working in the best interests of Scotland. Um, he was first elected to Westminster in 1974, served as a, a Labour MP, obviously a bit of a troublesome one. <laughs> he spent a large part of um, his career um, actively working for devolution. But when the Scottish Parliament was re reconstituted, the Labour Party refused to allow him to be a, a candidate in the, that election. He stood anyway as an independent, got 54% of the vote, so I think it was the Labour Party that lost out in that one. He was chairman of the advisory board of Yes Scotland in the referendum campaign. And I don't think there's anybody better qualified to articulate a vision of Scotland better than Dennis Cameron. country in just under an hour tonight. It took me over two hours. Uh, I believe there's a big match on in Glasgow tonight that may have something to do with it, but uh, we must look at ways of improving uh, transport connections, connectivity, etc. Anyway, it's good to be back uh, here in Ayrshire. Uh, I think the last time I had the privilege of speaking at a meeting uh, in this part of Scotland uh, uh, was uh, during the last uh, referendum campaign, the, the, the Scotland uh, the referendum campaign uh, in 2014. Uh, as Richard said, I chaired the advisory board of the Yes Scotland campaign uh, and I well remember that at the beginning of that campaign, it was a long campaign beginning way back in the year 2012, and at the start of the, that campaign, uh, some of the opinion polls uh, put support for Scottish independence at less than 30%. And by the end of that campaign, on polling day, that had increased to 45%. Um, not enough, not enough to win, and uh, I was certainly gutted when the, the votes were uh, counted uh, the day after uh, polling day. I'm sure that many of the rest of you shared my bitter disappointment. But nevertheless, 45% uh, is a good, solid base on which we can work to build victory uh, next time round. Uh, looking back on that campaign, I think that there were many lessons that we can learn. And before going on to outline my vision uh, of the future, I, I would like to just uh, reflect on some of the lessons, perhaps, that we can learn uh, from the past. Uh, some of them were uh, positive lessons, I suppose. The, the public meetings that we had, I myself did a tour of Scotland at least twice, uh, and uh, the attendance at the public meetings were very, very good indeed. Some of the political pundits had told us in advance that, oh, you're yeah, wasting your time, nobody goes to public meetings in this day and age, you know. But in fact, the public meetings were very well attended, uh, partly because the audience were given the opportunity to speak and to ask questions rather than just politicians speaking down to them uh, all the time. And uh, I think it was partly due to the attendance in these public meetings and the dialogue that we had with the public uh, that uh, we got such a big turnout on polling day, 85%. That was the biggest exercise in participatory democracy that Scotland has ever seen. Uh, the door-to-door -door canvassing, I think, also contributed to, to that, because although I agree about the importance of uh, social uh, media, uh, and we had an excellent team of uh, social uh, media advisors at, at uh, headquarters, uh, I never ever underestimate the importance, too, of uh, speaking to people face-to-face -face at the doorstep or wherever we get the, the opportunity. Uh, now, they also mentioned uh, other media and the comparison between social media and other media. Well, if we look at the, the print media during the last campaign, uh, not a single 
daily newspaper uh, supported uh, uh, campaign. And that lack of diversity in Scotland, I think, is a disgrace. Whatever side of the argument we have to be on, I think, if we have a genuine free press, then we need a diversity of opinion to be uh, expressed. Uh, since the referendum, of course, since the last referendum, we have seen the birth of the, the National and indeed the, the Sunday National. And I'm sure that we all uh, congratulate Richard on his great work and hope that he will continue uh, his great work. But I do think, too, that we ought to look at some of the, the other papers, the Unionist-inclined uh, papers, uh, and I do think that we should try to get our message across despite the difficulties, whether it's by writing letters to the editor or if we are articulate enough or literate enough perhaps to write uh, articles uh, to these newspapers because it's the readers of these newspapers that we've got to convert uh, to, to the cause. Also looking back, I think we need a far more effective rebuttal machine to, counterpart, to counteract the propaganda that we came up against uh, during the last campaign. We need to be more proactive instead of being on the back foot. We were too often caught on the defensive and it's up to us next time round to try and seize the initi initiative to set the agenda and put across a positive case, a positive vision of a better Scotland. So, we've got to look at better ways of getting our message across, but I also think we've got to look at the actual content of our message. And here we must be, well, honest enough and humble enough to admit that we have made mistakes uh, in the past and it's up to us to identify these mistakes and to rectify these mistakes to ensure victory uh, next time round. Now, I think there is general recognition now that the option um, which was outlined by the Scot Scottish Government at the time, the option regarding currency, was a hostage uh, to fortune. Uh, that it was, in fact, giving our opponents uh, a veto. Uh, because there's no way in which you can have a currency union unless the other partner agrees to participate in that currency union. And I think that the Growth Commission, which was published earlier this year, the Growth Commission report, uh, I think that uh, uh, it virtually uh, admits that. Uh, but I'm not so sure that what they have come up with is much better. I see at the outset that there may be, emphasised may, there may be practical reasons for keeping the pound sterling on day one, but a transition period of up to 10 years would be very, very difficult to sell uh, on the doorstep. Uh, it would mean that uh, our exchange rates and our interest rates would be determined by the Bank of England. It would be even worse than what we have now, because at least we have a, a wee bit of an input uh, into the Monetary Committee of the Bank of England uh, but uh, with the proposal, albeit an interim proposal, but a very long, uh, with a very long transition period, I mean, uh, with this, as is proposed by the, the Growth uh, Commission, then I would ask what kind of independence is that when our exchange rates are <laughs> The Growth Commission also raised the question of oil revenues and the economy. Uh, in that regard, I think that the 2014 White Paper was too optimistic on oil revenues, which should be seen as a bonus rather than the basis for sustainable uh, economic growth. Scotland's place in Europe posed difficulties last time round. Uh, Ironically, our opponents said that if we voted for independence, we would risk being kicked out of the European Union. And now, of course, because we are members of the United Kingdom and the Brexit vote has taken place, we are in danger, Scotland is in danger of being kicked out of the European Union, despite the fact that 62% of the electorate in Scotland voted to remain. Uh, so Scotland's relations with the European Union will obviously have to be uh, updated. Pensions were another problem. Um, there was a D 
DWP letter, the Department of Working Pensions, UK Government Department letter specifically saying what's to the effect that, that pensions would not be, uh, the state retirement pension would not be adversely effect, affected uh, if we voted for uh, independence. But there must have been a lot of people who didn't uh, believe that. Uh, despite the fact that if you look at the European legal pensions, we are near the bottom uh, rather than at the top of the European League. But we must face up to the fact that within my age group, and you age you too, uh, <laughs> uh, within my age group, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Over 70%, yes, over 70% of people of, of, of age 65 or over voted no. So we've got a huge job to do regarding that uh, demographic. So these are just some of the points uh, to consider. But the overriding consideration is how to win in the ref to whenever it may come. The First Minister earlier this year uh, said that she would consider the timing once there is clarity on the outcome of the Brexit <laughs> negotiations. Well, clarity, what, what is clarity? I mean, it's, if you look at the situation at Westminster, um, there's not much clarity there, but things may, things may become uh, clearer in the not too uh, distant future. But within the lifetime of this uh, Scottish Parliament, I, I think is a, a reasonable case to state, for India left, to bearing in mind that uh, the mandate expires in 2021, and there is no guarantee, I know there's hope, but there's no guarantee that the potential Scottish Government would win another mandate, especially if the existing Scottish Government is seen to be persecuting uh, around on the matter of a second referendum. But the, the timing is not within my gift, it's not within your gift, it's not within the gift of anybody uh, in this room. We must be ready and ready to go as soon as the starting gun is fired, and we must start preparing now. Can I have a drink of water, please? <laughs> Before I get on to my final point. <clears throat> yeah, so my final point is this, and I think it's the most important point, that we must fight a broad-based united campaign embracing people of different political persuasions. Of course, the SNP, as the party of government, must play a major role, the leading role. Uh, but SNP members and SNP voters are not enough in themselves to win the next referendum. If you look at last year's general election result, the Westminster general election result, uh, for example, then uh, certainly the the SNP won a majority of seats in Scotland, 35 out of 59, that's what we want, 59 or 60 percent. But if you look at the number of votes, it's nowhere near a majority, it was only 37 percent of the vote. So we must win more hearts and minds of people of different political parties and people of no political party at all, people like myself. Uh, uh, for example, I think, well, Richard said something about my uh, political uh, background. I was virtually born and brought up uh, in the Labour Party. Uh, my grandfather was a founding member of the first branch of the Labour Party to be started in the county of Fife, uh, way back at the turn of the 19th, 20th centuries. Um, I was elected as a Labour MP in 1974 and as an independent MSP uh, when the Scottish <coughs> Parliament was set up in 1999. I have campaigned for the Scottish Parliament virtually all of my political life. But I did not always, I did not always believe in Scottish independence. So I am a convert to the cause and we must win many more converts uh, to the cause. And, uh, well, you may have heard of some uh, recent um, celebrities, I suppose, uh, famous people, um, um, people who uh, have changed their mind. There's uh, Murray Foote, um, Richard's professional. He used to be the editor of the Daily Records, and he, a 
apparently he was co-author along with Gordon Brown of the so-called vow, uh, which was spread right across the front page of the, the Daily Record a few days before uh, election day. Uh, there's Tom Morton, um, musician and broadcaster, who has publicly announced that he has changed his mind in his voting for independence. Uh, there's Mike Daly, the human rights activist and very respected uh, lawyer. Before I finish, I'm going to tell you a wee story about another conversion which took a long time. This goes back to the 1997 general election when I was defending the most marginal Labour seat in Scotland, a majority of 367 after a recount. Well, on the eve of polling day, I got a phone call uh, from a constituent who said, Dennis, I'd like to come out tomorrow and help you. I said, well, tomorrow's polling day, and I'm going to be doing a tour of the constituency with my loudspeaker, just making sure that people get out and vote and doing a wee spiel, street meetings, and so on. He said, right, I'll come with you. And so he did. So I arranged to pick him up uh, with the car and the loudspeaker at his home near Drimmon on the banks of Loch Lomond. And we did a tour of the constituency, starting at Driven, then going through places like Killern and Strathblane and Lennoxton and Milton at Campsie and Kilsyth and Cleanyburn and Banknock and Henry on Head and Bonnie Bridge. And uh, I think we finished up uh, at uh, Bannockburn. Um, well, by that time, the, the Bairns and some of the adults too were literally dancing in the streets. Uh, not because of my dancing skills, I'm in the same category as Theresa May. <laughs> but uh, uh, my comrade in arms, my, my co campaigner, uh, was the big one himself, Billy Connolly. I believe now he rejoiced at the name of Sir Liam uh, Connolly. At that time, he was nearly as famous as what he is now. And uh, OK, it was a sort of gimmick getting him out to dance in the streets and give us a wee song and tell a few jokes and all that. But it seemed to work. <laughs> <laughs> because, lo and behold, my majority went up from 367 to over 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and during the course of that day, uh, as we toured the constituency, uh, Billy Connolly and I talked about a lot of things in the back of the car in between our street meetings. Uh, and um, I think I probably agreed on most things, but I could not, I could not get him converted to the idea uh, of a, 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 a Scottish Parliament, never mind independence. That, uh, so, so the road from Drimmon to Bannockburn, it was not like Paul's journey from Jerusalem to <laughs> Jesus. And I soon, I soon realised that, uh, no, he's not, going to, he's not going to change his mind uh, on this one. In fact, it was quite derisory. It was, it was ridicule the, the very idea of a Scottish Parliament. It would pass it off as a joke. Uh, and then, Years later, when the Scottish Parliament eventually became a reality, uh, he dismissed it as a, a wee pretendy Parliament. Uh, um, well, I couldn't believe it when just a few days ago I picked up the paper. <laughs> and lo and behold, uh, it appears, if you believe the papers, <laughs> it would appear that Sir William Connolly is now moving towards. Uh, independence. Well, I say to you, if we could convert the lights in Billy Conley, uh, we could convert many, many more uh, hearts and minds. Uh, so uh, let's go for it. In Billy's case, it was uh, Brexit, apparently, if we believe the story. In his case, it was uh, Brexit, uh, which was the point of conversion. Uh, in my case, it wasn't any one particular event. But my conversion 
was based uh, mainly on my parliamentary experience, 26 years at Westminster, eight years at the Scottish Parliament. I've been retired now for 11 years, and, well, retirement gives you time to, to think, and I have drawn at least three conclusions from my experience, namely my parliamentary experience. The first conclusion is Westminster is completely out of touch with the people of Scotland. My second conclusion was that the Scottish Parliament, right from its inception, seemed to respond far more positively to the wishes, the needs, and the aspirations of the people of Scotland. And even in its early days, there were uh, several examples of when various different uh, political parties uh, were in power. Uh, there was the abolition of tuition fees, uh, there was the free care for the elderly, uh, the free prescription charges within our national health service, uh, there was land reform, and they mentioned the importance of land to the Scottish economy. Westminster never had time for land reform. They neither had the time nor the inclination to bring about uh, a land reform. At least the Scottish Parliament has made a start, and I hope that more radical measures uh, will be taken. However, despite all the positive achievements of the Scottish Parliament, and I could go on and on with a, a litany of the, the, these achievements, um, the powers of the Scottish Parliament um, are very limited. For example, macroeconomic powers are reserved to Westminster. The Scottish Parliament does not have the power to decide whether we should have uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, in the Firth of Clyde. We don't have the power to decide whether we should be declaring war or not on another country. And as it has been seen recently, we do not have the power to decide whether we should remain members of the European Union. And recent events uh, at Westminster have demonstrated that the Scottish Parliament and the Westminster Parliament are not equal partners. Westminster is a sovereign parliament. The Scottish Parliament is not a sovereign parliament. The Scottish Parliament is a creature of Westminster. And Westminster, despite that fairly recent amendment to the Scotland Bill, Scotland Act, uh, Westminster has the powers that it wants to completely abolish the Scottish Parliament. Westminster can determine the powers of the Scottish Parliament, and as we have seen recently, it can legislate on devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, because the Sewell Convention is, as it says, merely a convention, not a legal requirement. It was Enoch Powell who wisely said, I didn't always agree with Enoch Powell, but he was right when he said, power devolved is power retained. So I come to my final conclusion. If the Scottish Parliament had the full powers of an independent parliament, then it would be able to do so much more for the people of Scotland and make Scotland a better place. I do not see independence as an end in itself. I see it as a means towards an end. I see it as a means towards delivering a more democratic Scotland, a more prosperous Scotland, a fairer Scotland, and a Scotland that will play its full part in the international community in order to help build a better world. That is my vision, and I believe that we should all work hard to turn that vision into a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Told you it would be good.